They say happy is the man who goes to work with pleasure in the morning and returns home with joy in the evening. According to this formula, Hugh is unhappy in all respects. At the city in the morning, he usually had to overpower himself not to cry out, going to his hated job at the shopping center. And in the evening, he sadly trudged home, knowing that he would once again be nagged by his wife, and even worse, his mother-in-law. Perhaps if his mother-in-law had less influence over his wife, things would be different, but the elderly woman practically lived with them. She had her own place, and it was a nice one. He would do repairs there himself, as he was highly skilled in this field. However, the elderly woman got bored being alone, so she came to visit the couple every day, and sometimes even stayed overnight. Under her influence, Gina, Hugh's wife changed for the worse. She constantly nagged her husband, accusing him of all kinds of faults and failures. It wasn't always like this. Hugh used to earn decent money doing repairs and was the head of his team. They had plenty of orders and could choose the most lucrative ones. But one day he suffered a setback. He was hit by a car and lost his health and ability to work. His leg was broken and he had an excruciating back pain. He spent a long time recovering and was unable to work. Initially, his wife took care of him. But as soon as she realized that the money was running out, she distanced herself from him. She was accustomed to the good life, and the prospect of poverty frightened her. She didn't work herself and had no hours doing so. When Hugh married Gina, his mother-in-law, Mrs. Weller, warned him that her daughter would never work. Let other women work like horses if they couldn't find a decent husband. The smart woman will never work, and my daughter is smart. And if you suddenly can't provide for her, well, there's no point in talking to you. She said, The young man was so in love with Gina, his green-eyed blonde wife, that he was willing to give her the world. He worked tirelessly, fulfilling her every wish. He fulfilled her every whim, only he could not decide on a mortgage, as his wife and mother-in-law tried to persuade him. I'll save up for an apartment myself. The apartment they lived in belonged to Hugh's relative, who had married and moved abroad. She didn't need the money, but she was in no hurry to part with the apartment either. She didn't want to rent it out to strangers, so she invited Hugh and his wife to live there, only paying for utilities. However, the apartment was small for Gina's standards, and she wanted to move out as soon as possible. At Tilly, her constant topic of conversation was, Hugh, when are we going to move out? Hugh, why don't you take out a mortgage? She became particularly insistent about the mortgage after she had squandered all of her husband's savings. Even her mother called Gina stupid when she found out how much money she had wasted on what she considered to be nonsense. But despite knowing that her husband was ill and couldn't work for a while, Gina continued to go out to restaurants and shopping with her friends, spending money on expensive hair treatments and the like. With no other option, Hugh, who hadn't fully recovered from the accident, had to find a job. He couldn't do any repairs anymore, at least not for now. Lifting heavy objects was contraindicated, and he experienced pain in his back and leg. 
Eventually, he got a job as a security guard at a clothing store. Door glip. I could, of course, standing on his feet for a twelve-hour shift was incredibly difficult, especially in his condition. And of course, he wanted to do more creative work, not spend his time looking out for shoplifters. But now he had no choice but to earn extra money. He also took on a night watchman job at a warehouse. At least there he could sit or walk around instead of standing. However, it was even more boring than the store. There was no one to interact with, no movement. He often felt sleepy, but to entertain himself, he watched videos on his smartphone about bushcraft, survival in the wild, and abandoned villages in the deep forest. Sometimes he felt the urge to leave everything behind and go somewhere far away away from people, just him and nature. He wanted to live in solitude and start afresh. Ex when he was healthy, there were always people around, colleagues, friends and acquaintances. But after the injury, they all disappeared. But only the most loyal ones remained. However, he didn't want unnecessary socializing. He had re-evaluated and realized many things. That's why he wanted to disappear for a while, to retreat. But it was impossible. Where could he go? He knew a little about such places, having already researched the subject. But what about his wife? She wouldn't go with him, and she wouldn't let him go alone and it would be incredibly difficult to part with Gina. He loved her too much. She nagged him at home, but it was easy to understand her. He had promised her a better life, and look what happened in the end. But on the other hand, Hugh wasn't responsible for the accident. It was the drunken rich man who ran the red light lost in his heavy thoughts. Hugh didn't notice how he reached home. But it was three o'clock in the afternoon, the time he was supposed to be at work. However, today, there was an emergency at their shopping center. Someone had called in a false threat, resulting in the police cordoning off the area and sending employees home. Well, at least I'll get five hours of sleep before the night. Hugh reasoned, in such a hurry to see her daughter. A tree Mrs. Weller forgot to close the door. The thought of her mistake pleased him, because now he would come in and chastise her for her absent-mindedness. It wasn't always him who should be the target of her ridicule. Let her be the accused for once. He quietly opens the door and entered the apartment. He intended to sneak into the living room and surprise his mother-in-law, then lecture her about locking the doors. However, when he heard the emotional conversation between the women, he froze in place. Well, you know, daughter, it's not so bad that Ken got you pregnant. And you, I wouldn't have grandchildren until I'm very old. He's a weakling, and Ken is a real man, the kind of guy you should have a child with. It doesn't matter who you're pregnant with. He'll still be my grandson. Mom, but Ken is married. Gina sobbed. Yes, yes, you've made a mistake in this. I've told you a million times not to get involved with married people. Well, you had a fling. It happens. But there's no reason to fall in love. But what am I supposed to do now? What should you do? Her mother grinned. Give birth, of course. I'm sorry I yelled at you earlier. Now I think it's for the best. 
and you know what else. I think Hugh will finally agree to take out a mortgage now. His salary is official. Ach, all his documents are in order. The bank will approve it. You can't live in this one-room apartment with a baby. Who knows how things will turn out? If Ken divorces his wife, you can go to him and the baby will grow up with his daddy. And Hugh will also pay child support. So don't worry, everything will be fine, daughter. Listening to his wife and mother-in-law's conversation. Hugh was in frustration. This is Gina pregnant with another man's child. Did she cheat on him? Why does fate punish me again? I always tried to be a decent family man, love my wife, respect my mother-in-law. But they thanked me with such an ugly surprise. And now what? Burst into the room and shout, Aha, gotcha. It would be dramatic, but foolish. Divorce? Yes, definitely. I love children, but I'm not going to take responsibility for my wife's and another man's sins. The thoughts swirled in the deceived husband's mind like scattered puzzles. Be sure of what to do. Hugh left the apartment, slamming the door loudly. The surprise caused his wife and mother-in-law to startle simultaneously. Did you hear that? What was that? Asked Gina. I think it was the door. Mom, did you forget to lock the door? Well, it happens I was in a hurry. Well, the women argued about who had forgotten to close the door and why. Hugh managed to walk two blocks and outlined a plan of action in his head. There was nothing else keeping him in this city. He could safely leave and fulfill his dream of becoming a Robinson, just as he had once dreamed. And to think about life, to clear his mind. Fortunately, there was still some money left in his account. He was also going to sell some electronics, a computer, things he wasn't going to need anytime soon. Of course, it would be cheap because he needed to sell them now, but he didn't care. His tool ease up to the important thing was to escape the city where lies and hypocrisy reigned. He didn't want to think to imagine how his wife had reached the point of infidelity, how long it had been going on. There were probably some signs that Hugh had missed, had not noticed due to inattention, or simply did not want to notice. One thing he knew for sure was that the name Ken had been mentioned too often in his family lately, and was Gina's classmate. Since attending a reunion, his name had been repeatedly mentioned. At first, Hugh even rejoiced that his wife had such a wonderful friend. At that time, he himself was unable to take care of his wife, as he believed she deserved. He couldn't help her with anything, take her out or do something for her. So it was great that there was a man who was willing to take care of her. Hugh didn't even dare to doubt his wife's fidelity, especially since Ken was also married with a family and children. But it turned out that this was not a barrier to infidelity. After withdrawing all money, the man went shopping at the tourist store and bought a complete outfit for surviving in the wilderness. Of course, he didn't plan to actually survive in the forest. He wanted to find an empty house somewhere, in a backwoods village, and live there without news, internet, or contact with the outside world. He bought many things from the store. A large backpack, similar to that of a mountaineer, a sleeping bag, ropes, a gas burner, a knife, and boots. 
He even had to call a cab because he couldn't carry everything himself. Gina was speechless when Hugh brought all his stuff home and started lovingly looking at fishing rods, lanterns, sturdy hiking boots, and other accessories. What the hell is this? roared the mother-in-law. And you. Mrs. Weller, relax. Don't get worked up. And you. Mrs. Weller, relax. Don't get worked up. You're expecting a grandson. And how do you know? gasped Gina. A magpie brought the news, sarcastically replied her husband. Surprise. Gina wanted to inform you in an unusual way to surprise and delight you. Are you happy that you and Gina will have a baby boy? Yes. I'm pleased that Gina and Ken are going to have a baby boy. Hugh teased Mrs. Weller. I hope that the wife of the future father, as well as his children, will also be happy with that news. Gina turned pale, but her mother, to her credit, did not lose her composure. Hugh, she said in an iron tone, shame on you. Your wife is pregnant, you should be happy, but you say such things. You accuse her of cheating on another man, and you're slandering her. I didn't expect this from you. Hugh, and I'm deeply disappointed. Mrs. Weller, can't you be disappointed with me somewhere else, like at your home? You're so rude. Hugh, the mother-in-law said through her teeth. Mom, stop, please. I'll handle it myself. Gina stopped her quietly. Hugh, why did you decide that the child is not yours? Gina, dear, I'm not going to discuss this, and I'm not holding you, and I don't want you to hold me. I demand a divorce. I know perfectly well that while you are pregnant, we will not be divorced. It can only be done on your own initiative, so please let's separate amicably, the man calmly replied. Well, no. Mrs. Weller intervened again. Tomorrow, Gina will get a pregnancy certificate. The child will be born in marriage and you will be obliged to recognize it? Well, all right. But only in this case. I go and tell Ken's wife everything. Who's her father, the owner of the big firm where Ken works? I wonder if he'll like the fact that his son-in-law has got an offspring on the side. I don't know. And in general, immediately after the birth of the child. I'll demand a DNA test. And as soon as I get the result, I'll sue you and get compensation for more damages. Is that what you want? Hugh straightened up and looked menacingly at his wife. Isner under his gaze. She seemed small and unhappy and even felt sorry for her. The mother-in-law was gnashing her teeth in anger. If she had the chance, she would have stuck her son-in-law with the huge serrated hunting knife he had just been holding. What a scoundrel you are! Hugh hissed the woman. Ooh, how you've changed your voice! What if I had made a child on the side? How would you react? We forgive and accept. I doubt it. And in general, please leave the apartment. I had put up with you only for the sake of your daughter before. It's not your apartment. It's hers too, shrieked the mother-in-law. She has the right to live here and decide whether I stay or go. Really? Well, then you both stay here and I'll leave. Oh, by the way, there's a bill for the utility. Tia, Mum, please let us be alone and talk to each other. 
Gina begged. Daughter, I won't leave you alone with this crazy man, protested the woman. Mum, please, we're adults. We'll sort it out ourselves. Groaning in her heart, Mrs. Weller left the apartment, and the couple remained to have a difficult conversation. Gina tried to fix the shards of their marriage, but Hugh thought that a broken cup would not be glued together, and the bright image of his once sinless wife was destroyed forever. Gina, Hugh said calmly, I don't want to cause a scene or have a confrontation, but it happened like this. You fell in love with another man or just gave in to a fleeting desire. I don't know. You know better. But you need to take responsibility for your actions. You're an adult. You take control of your life. And Ken needs to take responsibility for what he did. Talk to him. Maybe if he doesn't want to recognize the child, he'll at least provide financial support. Understand that I'm not your slave. And I won't go along with your wishes. Let's have a civilized relationship. Hugh, will you leave your pregnant woman? Gina asked quietly. Ask the same question, but not to me. Ask the father of your child, replied the man calmly. Trying to get Gina's credit, she didn't become stubborn or throw a tantrum. She simply accepted that Hugh was leaving her. But of course, she cried into her pillow, but the next day she packed her things and went to her mother's. When Gina left, Hugh felt relieved. No one would hinder him from focusing on his own thoughts. But of course, he was hurt deep in his heart. They had spent so many years together, and he had thought he had a family and a loving wife, and instantly his world was shattered. The man experienced a range of emotions, from hatred towards the betrayer to forgiveness and complete indifference. Then resentment and hatred resurfaced. The important thing was not to drink and to hold on. Moving out should help. As soon as the divorce was finalized, Hugh immediately started to materialize his plan. He began to see it as a second chance. Maybe he was not destined to live like everyone else in an overcrowded concrete box of a city. Although, who knows, maybe he would spend some time in nature, getting bitten by hungry gadflies, and then return to an apartment with heating and hot water. Fortunately, Hugh still had his loyal friends. It was they who suggested a place for him to move to. At a friend, I know a place where old Alfred lives. He is a hermit. Like many people consider him a forest spirit. He's already more than 90 years old, but he is strong and not boring to talk to. Answer and the place is wild. If something happens to you there, or if you can't survive, he'll take you out or inform the gamekeeper through a radio. In general, go to Alfred, He'll take you in, and you can become a helper to him, and do a good deed. And she went, but to the strange feeling overcame him as he left his hometown. Ahead of him was an unknown road. What awaited him there, beyond the horizon? It was both joyful and unsettling, and Hugh wasn't the only one who felt this way. A young girl named Marcy was walking along the highway, carrying a large old backpack on her shoulders. She was wearing a worn-out t-shirt, a man's jacket that didn't fit her old jeans, and completely broken sneakers. 
Apex, the girl tried to hitchhike, but some cars passed by, and she was afraid to get into others. But it was dangerous for a girl to travel alone, but Marcy had no other choice. She escaped from a nightmare that made any highway maniac seem like an angel. Marcy spent her childhood in a prosperous family. However, after her mother's death, her father turned to alcohol, quit his job, and rapidly spiraled downwards, dragging his children with him. Then the head of the family brought home a stepmother, a downcast, marginalized woman who had no place to live. But nevertheless, she was eager to teach everyone and command everyone. The stepmother quickly turned their apartment into bedlam, and Marcy's older sister hurriedly fled the place after getting married, while Marcy stayed behind. She tried to seek help and protection from friends, but always returned home. But despite his alcoholism, Mercy still saw her father as a kind man, remembering the times when he was normal. Growing up in such an unhealthy environment, Marcy struggled to finish school and was unable to pursue further education. She resorted to odd jobs to make a living, but life became increasingly difficult, and finally she packed her belongings and left. A friend kindly gave her a jacket to replace the one torn by her stepmother. I Percy yearned to start a new life away from her city. She believed that the capital offered abundant job opportunities and a place to live. Eventually, she caught a ride with a hitchhiker and arrived in Megapolis. Although she felt apprehensive about the unknown, Mercy was hopeful that she would find a better life in the capital than among alcoholics in a dilapidated apartment infested with bedbugs. That the vastness of the city overwhelmed Mercy, who came from a small provincial town. Everything seemed enormous and unfamiliar, making her feel unsteady. But the bustling and noisy train station only added to her disorientation. At the station, she bought a piece of pie and coffee, considering it an extravagant expense. Sitting in the waiting room, she pondered her next move. She had nowhere to go and couldn't stay in the waiting room indefinitely. Although they wouldn't kick her out, but spending the night at a train station felt odd. Marcy wondered if she could find a hostel and how much it would cost. She regretted not thinking about it beforehand and questioned her impulsive decision to take such a gamble. Suddenly, a tall guy in a leather jacket, whom Marcy had noticed earlier, approached her. He had walked by with friends, then returned alone, repeatedly glancing at her. He offered to buy her a drink since her coffee had run out. Brissy quickly declined, but the stranger left and soon returned with a cup of coffee, smiling and revealing his yellowish teeth. He handed her the cup, saying, here you go, or you'll have to eat the pie dry. The girl thanked the guy for the treat, and he introduced himself as Dan. He gave Marcy mixed feelings, something unpleasant yet trustworthy. Listen, Marcy, have you ever lived in a motorhome? No, the girl shook her head. Would you like to? I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Why don't you come with us? I'm staying with some friends outside of town. You won't have enough for a hostel anyway, and we'll help you out. In turn, you'll help us in a feminine way. No, 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 don't get me wrong. 
You'll be cooking the food and cleaning the cages. Anxious. Marcy was surprised. Yeah, didn't I mention it? He transport animals. Puts all sorts of foxes. Foxes? Do you have a min of dairy? Well, you could say that. The guy shrugged. No, I still don't agree. Marcy replied after considering. And to avoid further bother from the guy, she said her goodbyes and left. Marcy, we have a bear cube. It's small and affectionate like a puppy. The guy called after her. Perhaps he didn't anticipate such a reaction from her, but the girl stopped and looked at the boy attentively. Our bear cub, she questioned, then hurriedly approached her and whispered, Yes, but it's illegal to keep a bear, so don't talk about it. But don't even think about it. We're saving him. They killed his mother and brother and sent them to a restaurant. It's illegal to hunt bears with cubs, but the rich don't follow the rules. And this little guy was left behind. He would have died in the forest anyway. Mercy's mouth dropped open in surprise. Her opinion of Dan dramatically changed. It turned out he was a good person who saved animals. All right, Marcy replied. I'm in. Okay, let's wait for my friends then, said the guy. They left the station building, walked a short distance to the designated spot and started waiting for the car. Soon Dan's friends arrived. There were two of them sitting in a used juvie. Hello, Marcy greeted politely. Well, hello, the scruffy guy replied. But the other, a bald man with a big nose, simply nodded. They invited the girl to get into the car. Marcy hesitated. For some reason, she didn't like these men, but she didn't know anyone else in town. So she got in the car. As soon as the COV started moving, Marcy realized there was no turning back. Actually, fear gripped her heart, but soon she realized that the guys, despite not being the most attractive, had no intention of harming her. But it turned out they were taking her far away from town. Marcy felt tense. They took several turns through a wooded area until they reached a clearing. There was a small camp set up with tents, trailers, and vans. This is our temporary camp. You could say we're nomadic people, haulers of sorts, who transport animals. It's fun with us. Actions, we're not animals. We don't bite. The scruffy guy attempted to joke. Arcy shivered. She didn't like the place or the people, but it was too late to turn back. Stepping out of the car, Marcy surveyed her surroundings and caught the gazes of those present, unpleasant men with tobacco-stained teeth and obviously loved to drink. However, she smiled politely at each of them, not wanting to turn them against her. The young girl felt uncomfortable in the company of men, but Dan assured her that she would be safe here. And indeed, the girl was well taken care of. They provided her with a comfortable sleeping place in a separate tent, and of course they showed her their chargers. Mostly foxes, unhappy and frightened, locked in cramped cages. We are taking them to the places where the dogs are taught to hunt animals, Dan said, as if it was nothing special. Hi, should. Don't you feel sorry for the poor animals? Why pity them? In the wild, even worse conditions await them. 
They face challenges such as finding food, enduring the cold, fighting diseases, and competing for territory. Yes, but it's freedom. Here it's certain death without a chance to survive. And personally, I would ban hunting. Marcy frowned. You're thinking it was your female brain. Dan grinned. Firstly, controlling the animal population is important, and hunters fulfill that mission. Secondly, hunting is ingrained in men. If we stop hunting, we'll become weak. Do you? Do you understand? No, the girl shook her head. I don't understand that. But you eat meat, drink milk, and enjoy eggs, don't you? Have you ever considered the cruelty involved in meat and dairy production? Trust me, we're much less cruel than some farms. Come on, let me show you a bear cub. The girl sighed and followed Dan. Opening the van door, he revealed a small cage with a frightened bear cub inside. Oh, it's so cute, whispered Marcy. Can I hold him? You can, but be careful. He might bite. And by the way, I have a stun gun. Be going to shock him. Marcy couldn't believe what she was hearing. It was so cruel. Lunches. Look, why is he locked up? It's daytime. Maybe he could go for a walk. Put him on a leash and let him roam around. Or at least put his cage outside in the sunshine. Let him breathe a fresh air. No, I can't. He gets nervous, and then I can't calm him down. But when it's dark, he's calm. I'll give you a bottle. You can feed him milk. Dan walked away and soon returned with a dirty feeding bottle. I can't. But milk is cold said the girl, holding the bottle in her hands. It's fine. It won't catch cold. It can drink it safely, Dan laughed. But the girl didn't obey. She heated the water and held the bottle in the pot to warm up its contents a little. Then she opened the cage and carefully picked up the bear. And the frightened baby, with a large dark spot around its eye, resisted weakly. It seemed powerless. It didn't even immediately respond to the milk the girl offered. And I think he has diarrhea, Marcy observed. Really? A bear disease. That's not good. By the way, we have a wealthy client who ordered him. He's paying a good amount of money. Therefore, as a token of appreciation for your shelter, clean his cage and wash him, said Dan and went off to attend to other men, leaving Marcy to take care of the little bear. After feeding him, she found a wash basin and used it to wash the poor creature. The bear cub grumbled and complained in his own bear language, but didn't attempt to bite. You're a good one. Mercy soothed him. My little one, where's your mummy? Why are you alone? His mummy and little brother have become gourmet meals. That's the choir the wealthy people enjoy bear meat. Even foreigners come and try it, and they're delighted. One of the campers chuckled. Marcy didn't say anything, but pressed her lips together and walked away from the unpleasant man. What a terrible camp, and some wicked men. Marcy realized she didn't want to stay there. No, they're not just hunters. And they're torturers. Dan is all of this legal. She asked the lanky acquaintance from the train station as she finished cleaning the cage. 
Well, in fact, it's better to stay out of sight of the police and the zoo volunteers. He's meant in hunting, baiting, and consuming wild meat. We are an important part of this, so even if they catch us, they'll lose our case somewhere in the system. I see. The girl sighed. Tonight, Percy persuaded Dan to allow the little bear outside. And though it was tethered, it was still a better option than being confined to a cage. Etching as the people gathered around the campfire, the intoxicated men started trying to impress the girl with their jokes and banter. However, their humor mostly revolved around crude and offensive toilet humor. In an emotionally charged conversation, one of the campers asked if Marcy wanted to see how bears and circuses were taught to dance. Curious? Marcy replied, show me, but only if it's humane. Answers the camper eagerly obliged before Marcy could fully comprehend what was happening, the camper scooped up a shovel full of hot coals and threw them on the ground. He then placed the bear cub on the burning coals, restraining him with a leash to prevent his throat. The poor baby bear let out pitiful roars, cried loudly, and desperately tried to escape the painful ordeal. Meanwhile, the tormentor turned on some music. Look, he's dancing, the camper exclaimed with satisfaction. After a few more sessions like this, he'll dance without the coals whenever the music plays. Refined, Marcy screamed. Stop, please! She attempted to rush to the bear's rescue, but was restrained by Dan's arm. Have you never been to a circus? That's precisely how bears are trained there. Dan replied callously. Marcy screamed and struggled, desperate to end the torture. Her heart ached at the sight of the innocent bear cube dancing on the burning coals. Stop, she suddenly exclaimed. You're ruining your investment. He's already sick. You won't get paid for this. Enough! Dan agreed and nonchalantly placed the bear back into its cage. That's it, Marcy. Go to bed, too. I don't need any hysterics here. Well, the men stayed by the fire. Percy retired to her tent. She locked it securely to ensure no one would disturb her. However, sleep eluded her. She couldn't stop thinking about the sick bear cub and the caged foxes. Suddenly, she felt someone attempting to break into her tent. Who is it? But the frightened girl asked. It's me. Damn. Open up. I'm coming in anyway. He slurred in a drunken voice. Actantly, R.C. unlocked the tent. The memories of similar intrusions during her childhood with her father flooded her mind. His friends would knock on her door. Back then, she would lock the door and that's it. But now she had to open the tent to avoid angering Dan. What do you want? Marcy asked, pretending not to understand why he had come. Let's chat, the drunk suggested. Dan sat down beside her and placed his hand on her knee. I'm tired, Marcy mumbled. Or just stay sitting or lying down a bit, he said, trying to roll Marcy onto her side. What are you doing? And the girl protested. Marcy, I want a little love, he said with an unpleasant smile. Oh, oh, Marcy realized. So why didn't you just tell me you were interested in me from the beginning? 
I would have at least freshened up. As it is, I'm not shaved, unwashed, and wearing unclean underwear. Yuck! Dan grimaced, clearly disgusted. That's exactly what I'm saying. Let's do this another time. I'll clean up and tomorrow you can come back. I'll give you a real treat. But for now, just go, okay? You're no good to me when you're drunk. And tell your friends to leave me alone. All right. If you deceive me, you'll regret it. Got it. Yes, I understand. I won't deceive you, Mercy said casually, even though fear began to make her jaw tremble. Admittedly, the girl didn't expect her tactics to work. It wasn't easy to get rid of drunken men, yet somehow she succeeded. I must leave here tomorrow. She vowed and they'll save the bear. After waiting until everyone was asleep, she went to the vans, intending to open the cages and let the foxes out. But everything was locked so securely that the savior's attempts led to nothing. She had to go back to the tent, wiping away her tears of regret. Later, many years later, Marcy would go to that day and berate herself for not being able to help those foxes. In the morning, the girl approached one of the men and asked, Listen, where do you want me to bury the bear? What do you mean, bury it? Well, he's not well. He's about to die, the girl said nonchalantly. Come on, let's go and see, the man shouted. They opened the van and the cage, only to find the bear cub covered in a foul-smelling, suspicious-colored slurry. The bottom of the cage was also soiled. What's wrong with him? The man asked. It seems like he has bloody diarrhea and vomiting, but it's your own fault. You made him sick by feeding him anything and everything and torturing him, the girl replied. What's happening here? Dan, who had approached, asked. The bear cub's dying, the man replied. Oh no, what should we do? There's nothing you can do, Marcy said dismissively. He won't be here by evening. You've played a bad game. But the client is waiting, the man exclaimed. Dubbing his head, I'll take him to Dr. Lynch. Dan declared. Who's that? The girl asked. He's our veterinarian. He won't let him die. Dan replied, heading towards the car. Wait. I'm coming with you, the girl said. Okay, but then help me carry the cage. Dan said. No, no. I'll wrap him in a blanket and carry him in my arms. Marcy suggested, Don't be silly. He'll make a mess all over the cabin. Put him in the trunk, the man argued. Dan, do you want tonight to be like what I planned for you yesterday? Do you want that? Well then, don't argue, the girl said firmly. Uctantly, he agreed. When Marcy got to the car, Dan, who was ready to leave, asked, What do you need the backpack for? My stuff is in there, the girl replied, confused. Uh, no, leave the backpack. You have no right. Marcy resented. I do, and I have the right to demand a guarantee. So put the backpack down. No one's taking it. No one wants your female belongings. Sighing. Marcy dropped the backpack on the ground and pushed it away with her foot. At least she had time to scatter her passport, money, and cell phone in her pockets. Okay, let's go. We have to hurry. Wrapped in a blanket, 
The little bear grunted and fussed in his diaper as he stuck his muzzle out, his black nose moving restlessly, sniffing the air. Look, I think he's already being active, said the guy. Oh, really? He's vomiting blood. He doesn't know what's going on, so he's fussing. Fortunately for Marcy, the vet, whom Dan called Dr. Lynch, was in the capital. His clinic was private and small. Dan parked his car in the backyard, and he and Marcy went to the appointment together. Dr. Lynch is in surgery. Wait a bit. He'll be free soon, the woman at the reception desk said at once. Rich Marcy and Dan sat down on a bench in the corridor and waited. Like the bear cube fiddled in the blanket, then began to grumble and even tried to roar. You're treating him like a child, Dan muttered, and for nothing. He's not a man, he's a beast. They grew up fast just a little more, and he'll be huge, ready to bite your head off. It's my brother used to hunt bears, and he felt as if it wasn't he who was hunting the bear, but the bear who was hunting him. One day the bear trapped us. I barely got away, and my brother got half his head blown off in one blow. He's a killing machine, not a kitten or a puppy. Understand it. We'll get the money and forget about him. Percy listened silently and began to choke. She opened her mouth, trying to gulp at least a little air, waving her hand and bulging her eyes. It was obvious that the girl was in a panic. What's wrong with you? And asked worried, Asthma? The girl barely managed to utter a word. It must have fallen out in the car. Please bring it back soon. It's on the floor. It must be somewhere on the floor. And hurriedly left the clinic and made his way to the car, leaving Marcy breathless in the corridor. As soon as she estimated that he had turned the corner of the building, her breathing returned to normal, and she quickly moved away from the clinic, running in the opposite direction of the parking lot. She didn't have a plan, only a vague idea of how to free the little cub from his tormentors and deceive Dan by pretending she had asthma. The rest was uncertain. Earlier that morning, she concocted a repulsive mixture of zucchini, ketchup, and roadside mud. She smeared this disgusting mess on the bear and the bottom of the cage. Randy Marcy worried whether the baby would lick it off, but he was smarter than that and didn't touch the foul substance. She presented this mixture as vomit and bloody diarrhea. Deceiving those scoundrels was easy, but now what? Should she find some animal rights activists? But who's to say they would be trustworthy? Marcy had seen news reports about criminals pretending to be anyone, and she also feared they might turn her into the police. It was all very unsettling for her. Initially, Marcy aimlessly walked between buildings, trying to get further from the clinic and Dan. She avoided the main road and hardly noticed the weight of the furry baby she tightly held in her hands. But eventually, exhaustion set in, and besides, the cub started growling hungrily. Percy bought ready-made baby milk and sat on a bench to feed him. The bear cube was still covered in the grimy mixture she had used to portray his illness, well, it happily slurped his food. Marcy surveyed her surroundings. She found herself in an old neighborhood filled with old buildings. Some windows were boarded up, 
others were broken or missing entirely. There was not a soul in sight, no children playing or kittens roaming around. The absence of old ladies sitting on benches or people smoking near the driveway was eerie. Keep feeling unsafe. Marcy decided not to linger in the street and made her way to the entrance of one of the buildings that looked abandoned. The creaking hinges opened the front door, allowing her way to the entrance of one of the buildings that looked abandoned. The creaking hinges opened the front door, allowing her to enter the building uninvited. But what she saw inside was perplexing. But even in the dim light, Marcy could tell that the doors to all the apartments were broken or ajar. Some were wide open, revealing the disarray within. Fear gripped Marcy's legs, making it difficult to move. Suddenly, she heard footsteps coming from downstairs. Being on the second floor, Marcy panicked thinking it might be Dan. In a moment of fear, she rushed into the first, into the first apartment she could find. The terrified Marcy stood in the hallway for a moment, then mustered the courage to explore further. Her heart pounded, feeling as if it were held in the icy grip of fear. She cautiously entered the kitchen and was horrified by what she saw. Hence the drawers were intact, but utensils were scattered on the floor, as if there had been a raid or a search. Hence the refrigerator, which had been unplugged, was slightly ajar, emitting a repugnant smell of spoiled food. Suppressing a gag reflex, Marcy ventured into the room. The furniture was broken and belongings were strewn about. What on earth happened here? Percy nervously wondered, deciding it was best to leave the suspicious apartment. At Wayne, when she went out to the stairwell, she heard those people again. She became afraid and decided to try her luck at the next door. Upon entering the apartment without hindrance, she saw the same scene. All things were in place. The clothes were lying around. It was as if people had been evacuated rushing. There was even a cup of dried coffee on the table. They were in such a hurry that they didn't take books, photos, cosmetics, or furniture. It was terrifying. Marcy found herself in a terribly mystical state, causing her whole body to shake. It felt as if she had entered a parallel world, where everything was strange and dangerous. The bear suddenly became unbearably heavy, causing the girl's hands to ache. Gus, don't drop it, thought Marcy, deciding to go up one more floor. Marcy entered another abandoned apartment. But to her surprise, it was empty, although the repair work appeared new and expensive. The apartment had light-colored laminate flooring, light-colored walls, and a mosaic-lined bathroom with a combined toilet. Inside, there was an impressive shower cabin. Apart from a light leather sofa placed in the center of the large living room, there were no other belongings. Patation on the sofa, there was a crumpled woolen blanket, which was also gorgeous. It was quiet and bright, and Marcy felt a desire to stay in this apartment. And as she approached the couch, Marcy grabbed the corner of the blanket and pulled it towards herself. Pulling harder, she suddenly realized that there was a man lying under the covers. He was perfectly still and seemed to be dead. But with fear and surprise, the girl let out a loud scream, 
startling the man. Suddenly, the man who was lying down stirred abruptly sat up on the sofa and looked at Marcy with dazed eyes. He bellowed, who are you? But the face of the man appeared to have been stung by bees. Mercy, screaming once again out of fear, rushed to the door and didn't even notice how she quickly overcame two flights of stairs. She thought she heard the sound of footsteps coming after her from downstairs. There was no staircase leading to the attic, and all the apartments on the last floor were closed. In desperation, the girl cried out, Help! At that very moment, the door of one of the apartments opened and a sturdy elderly man appeared on the threshold, wearing a t-shirt, slippers, and colorful trousers. A plictory in his hand, he firmly held an axe, which, judging by the expression on the grandfather's face, seemed ready to be used at any moment. What's wrong? He asked. And she caused the first peepok since the hour, and being chased, shouted the girl. Or by whom? I don't know. But come into the apartment quickly, said the grandfather, as he remained standing in the stairwell. Who's there? He barked a question to those below. It's us. Back to Mr. Kosh, us and agreed. But came from not doing anything wrong, came a high male voice. Yes, dot Mr. Kosh, we're not doing anything wrong, echoed another voice. Well, behave yourself. Billing Mr. Kosh, relented or I'll deal with you quickly. He entered the apartment and closed the door. I'll come in, don't be afraid. These are the local bums, he said to a bewildered Marcy. But it happened. Ben, ask the elderly woman who appeared from the kitchen. Oh, Sarah, don't worry, those fools frightened the girl. The elderly man shrugged. I'm part of you. A success of keys, and why is she running around here? Asked the wife, apparently not intending to address the guest. Well, we'll ask her that now. Put the kettle on. Sarah? The woman obediently shuffled into the kitchen, and the elderly man gestured for Mercy to follow her. The girl looked around confused. It was an ordinary apartment, clean and cozy, but with old repairs. It was a typical apartment where elderly people lived. What do you have there, daughter? Just a dog or something? Asked the man, poking at the grumbling blanket that Marcy clutched to her chest. Oh, and you won't give me away, pleaded Marcy. No, what's the matter? Why are you afraid? Oh, sighed the girl, and she spread the blanket on the kitchen floor, revealing a bear cub. The bear, tired of being swaddled, immediately started shaking its head and stretching out its paws. Bear, gasped the elderly woman. Well, not a bear, but a bear cube, the elderly man clarified thoughtfully. Where did you get it? Did you steal it from the zoo? Oh, of course not, sighed the girl. I took him from some very wicked people. Like they wanted to kill him. His mum was killed, his little brother too, and they wanted to torture him, and also foxes. They almost kidnapped me too. They have all my things. And where are your parents? asked the man. My mother is dead. My sister doesn't care about me, and my father has already gone mad from drinking with my stepmother. Poor child, sighed the elderly woman. I'll sit down to drink tea. There's some apricot jam. That she'll tins your help yourself. Marcy was starving, 
so she gladly drank tea with bread and jam. Tell me, she asked, what's going on in your house? Why are all the apartments open? Why are things abandoned? As if people were fleeing in panic. What happened? For an alien invasion? Some kind of mysticism I don't understand. Not stopping to consider the little miracle that was swarming on the floor of his kitchen. So it's simple here, no mysticism, just a resettlement. What? Marcy didn't understand. Resettlement, the elderly woman repeated in syllables. Old houses are being prepared for demolition, and people are being moved into new ones. We are the last ones left. They haven't turned off the water or gas for us yet. Wow. The girl was surprised. Why didn't you leave? Were you cheated? Well, one apartment we were shown was much better than this one, and the neighborhood is great, but my wife stubbornly said no. I won't go. Let's go to another. Well, they found us another one, even better than the previous one, and again, she didn't like it. After a while, they called and invited me to look at the apartment. I was astonished. It was such a great place, but my wife wasn't satisfied again. Now we're waiting for another offer. I suppose we don't die before we can get it. It's greed. Sarah, that's your problem. Mrs. Koch snorted and said, You know, one day our grandchildren will live in our apartment. They will inherit it, and I want to do everything possible for them. I'm sure you'll be lucky, replied the girl kindly, them. I don't understand how people left, and even left food on the table and in the refrigerator, and clothes and photos. It's such a mess. Don't worry your head, laughed the old man. People don't need old junk in a new apartment. It won't fit there. And why wash the dishes if you're not going to take it anyway? It's going to be demolished anyway. You know, I was in the white apartment. There was a leather sofa with a bum sleeping on it. That's Kari. Mrs. Coke waved her hand. You shouldn't be afraid of him. He's humble. Yes, he took the apartment. The accountant and her husband used to live there. I don't know what he did for a living, but they lived well. That they left the sofa. I don't know why, but Carl is like a king on it. The things scattered around are the work of looters. They're looking for something valuable. The neighboring apartments are untouched. El Palmike to Tushins. I don't let them in, but in the neighboring buildings, they've taken away everything in the apartments. Yes, because of my stubbornness, we have to live with homeless people. But we have a deal, and they're like guards. Marginalized people don't touch us. We touch them. Let them take the goods from other people's apartments. People moved out gradually, and if they left something behind, it's because they didn't consider it valuable. But okay. Now tell us about your bear. It's a long story, but he needs to be cleaned and fed. We'll organize that now. Mrs. Coast rejoiced. She heated some milk, and Marcy began to feed the bear from a spoon. The cub grunted with joy, almost like a little piggy. Well, well, take your time, don't be greedy, the old woman scolded the bear cub, as she probably used to say to her grandchildren. Then together they washed the roaring bear cub in warm water. At first the cub tried to bite, but then it got used to the water and calmed down. 
after the bath, the child of the forest was wrapped in a clean towel and placed in a large basket to dry off and sleep. It's like labeled, grinned the elderly man looking at the little guest. Yes, indeed, smiled Marcy, looking at the dark spot around its eye. How unusual! That for nothing that you met him on your way, and it was not for nothing that he got you, the man said meaningfully. Tell me, what do you plan to do next? I don't know, sighed the girl. But where will I take him? I don't trust the zoo. I don't trust zookeepers either. What zoos? Mrs. Koch intervened. He should be released into the wild, into nature. Let him out in the woods. He'll be lost or the hunters will catch him again. The girl shook her head. Oh, I can't just let him out in the forest. And it's not just the forest he needs, but his native element. Ben, can you help? Can you get in touch with old Alfred? It's difficult, but it's all right. Tomorrow I'll go to the post office and give him a telegram, nodded the grandfather confidently. For a telegram? Marcy was surprised. Do they still exist? Of course. There is no communication where Alfred lives. It's a remote visit. He hasn't got a telephone or internet connection there, but every week he goes to another village to the post office. He'll get a telegram to tell him you're on the way. On my way? For two, gasped the girl. To him, Mrs. Koch laughed. We to the end of the world. No, I'm not going, the girl was frightened. Oh, you don't be afraid. It's a magical place, enchanted. But to perspective, you Aryans, when a person is in some trouble, when a person is lost in life, he can come to that village and be healed. And many people have been healed that way. Asked Marcy. Oh, note many, because not everyone is ready to take responsibility for their life. And you. Arcy, don't be afraid. You've been given this cub as a guide. This is your chance. Don't miss it. So you're going to Alfred? We'll equip you for the journey. Mr. Coke said confidently. It's embarrassing. Mercy said, I'm nobody to you. There are no stranger children. It's not for nothing you came into our house. Just think about how many events took place before we met. You're being guided by Providence. You'll go with our son. He's a trucker. He'll take you to one place. Then he'll give you to his friend, the gamekeeper, and he will take you to Alfred's village. The girl realized that there was nothing left for her but to agree to this adventure. But for the last couple of days, she had experienced so much that traveling to the unknown lands no longer frightened her. You, you, don't be silly. Look what a machine I've made for you. Especially for your back and for your leg. Yes, it's hard, and I'm not sure it will help. Hugh protested. I come seven sweats to get over the construction the old man had made for him out of improvised materials. But that was not all. The old man treated the young man with stinking ointments and herbal remedies. After a while, he began to realize that he saw and thought differently the world had become much wider and deeper than it was before. The former problems, limitations, and complexes receded into the background. It's nothing. Alfred repeated. 
I'll put you on your feet. Hugh, who had survived the betrayal, liked it here in the wilderness. No fuss, no acquaintances, no social games, only primitive life and nature was better than any psychotherapist. The experience he gained cannot be overestimated. It came to the point that he even began to feel gratitude towards his wife, because if it were not for her, he would not have gotten to the village and would not have learned wisdom from the old. Tommy. One day, Alfred and Hugh had a serious conversation about life and the future. What should I do next? Teach me. You have to decide for yourself. I'm not your counselor. It's so difficult to decide. I like it here, and I'd like to go to civilization. You'll leave when you think it's necessary, said the old hermit. But you're not ready yet. Your body is weak, and your spirit is not strong. The pain in your soul is still there. Until it's cured. Don't go. How will I know when it's time? Asked you. You'll realize it at the right time. Will you miss me? Asked the young man with a smile. Why should I miss you? I'd rather be happy for you. For being married, for having family. Family, kids, work and health. What else do you need? Wife, children. He said bitterly. My wife betrayed me treacherously and cruelly. I'm afraid to start a family now. I don't know where to look for a wife. And you do not look. She will find you, said Alfred confidently. At that very moment, there was a quiet knock at the door. Come in. Why are you treading on the threshold? said the old man. The door creaked open, and a young girl entered the room. She appeared to be ordinary, but pretty at the same time. She held a bear cub in her arms, and from the tension in her arms, it seemed the cub was heavy and she wanted to put him down on the floor. He jumped up from his chair in surprise and immediately lost the ability to speak. He felt embarrassed and smiled foolishly. The girl herself was also embarrassed and didn't know what to say. Yeah, she said quietly. I've come. I well, sit down since you've come, invited the hermit, as if nothing extraordinary had happened. We'll drink tea. Let him go. Let him go where he wants. He is the master here. The bear is not our guest. Us, on the contrary, we are its guest here in the forest. Marcy was relieved to let the bear cube go to the floor and shook her tired arms to relax. Thank you for the welcome, she said and sat down at the table. Hugh immediately began to serve her tea and to the girl, this tea seemed like the most delicious in the world. It was surprising for Marcy to be in such a wilderness, at the edge of the world, in an old house made of strong logs. However, at the same time, she felt safer and more at home than ever before. There's a church in the village. We can marry you if you want grinned the hermit, admiring how cheerfully his guests were chatting. Marcy blushed and lowered her eyes, while Hugh glanced reproachfully at the old man, causing him to chuckle beneath his silver beard. The next day, Hugh was building an enclosure for the bear cub, while the old man watched and gave commands. But it's a pity to leave him outside. I'd rather have him in the house, sighed the girl. He doesn't need to get used to humans. Hugh will make him a warm den and he'll be fine. And don't pick up the cub anymore. 
thumps stroke him. He needs to wean from the smell of humans. Arcy sighed. It was difficult to part with her dear friend. He'd become so tame, and now she had to turn him into a wild animal. Arturim, now all she had to do was feed him and watch him grow into a strong bear, the master of the wild forest. She also had to let go of her resentment and the past and drop the label of being the daughter of alcoholics. She needed to believe in herself and started living happily. At first, Percy, like any young girl in her place, missed the internet, social networks, and music. Music. But soon, she learned to communicate with nature, talk to trees, listen to the music of the wind, and enjoy the singing of birds. But together with Hugh, they went to the forest to pick mushrooms and berries, and the old man taught the girl to look for useful herbs. The bear cub was let out every day to run and play. At first, he was afraid to run far from home and always came straight back. He grew quickly, and he wasn't ready to leave for a life in the wild. At each time, his excursions into the forest became longer than the previous ones. It's nearly two years past. As promised by Alfred, Hugh was cured of his illnesses and became strong and healthy. There was no sign of his limp anymore. His labor had worked wonders. Marcy also let go of the burdens of her past and blossomed, becoming more beautiful. She even found a hobby pottery. She made such beautiful housewares on the pottery wheel that Hugh was amazed by them. One day, tourists visited the old man's farm. When they saw Marcy's pottery, they bought almost everything. Meanwhile, Hugh finally realized that Alfred was right, and indeed his wife had come to him. He proposed to her, and the girl gladly accepted. They got married in the church that the old man had mentioned. See, on the same day, when they returned home, they didn't wait for their bear, who had gone into the woods that morning. Well, maybe he'll come back, the newlyweds wondered, but the old man simply shook his head. That's it, he is gone to conquer his forest. There's no need for him to stay with us, and it's time to leave for both of you. The village has given you everything it could. Live happily, children, and don't worry about me. Others will take your place. Much from these words, Marcy cried, although she realized that it was really time to say goodbye to the hermit. He jokingly asked, What about you? Don't you miss us? After all, we've lived together for two years. Why should I miss you? Emmett was surprised. I will only be happy for you that you live well and in harmony. And don't miss me, too. Just be happy for me when you remember me. The newlyweds didn't delay their departure. First they bid farewell to the house nature and the old man and set off for their new life. Initially, life wasn't easy for the young couple in the city. They had to adjust to urban life from scratch. Hugh rented the cheapest apartment because he had very little money left from his meager savings. Marcy had some money from selling pottery, but she spent it on clothes because she wanted to look beautiful in the city. Here come the social games. Hugh laughed. The main thing is that our love boat doesn't get wrecked by everyday life. Fortunately, that didn't happen. He quickly resumed doing repairs for customers and started earning a decent income. 
Marcy initially focused on her creativity, pottery art, and then began combining pottery wheel and studying. Hugh supported her in all her endeavors. Touched one day, while walking down the street, Hugh pointed out an elderly couple to his wife. They walked hand in hand, as if they were young. Look, isn't it great? I wish we could have that kind of relationship when we're old. Wait, wait. Marcy said thoughtfully and ran up to the couple. Oh, Mrs. Coach. Mr. Coach, she exclaimed joyfully. I'm so happy to meet you. Percy, the old couple rejoiced. How are you? You look marvelous. Oh, the young woman sighed. If you only knew how you influenced my life. And this is my husband. Hugh, by the way, tell me what happened to you. Where are you living now? Well, Sarah was right, Mr. Coach said. They gave us such a gorgeous apartment. It's like a palace. But our grandson complains that parking near us is costly. And Topter is the boatmate and may have gone a little overboard, the old lady admitted and laughed. After saying goodbye, Hugh and Marcy promised themselves that they would do everything to maintain the same kind of relationship when they grew old. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, there was another scene. The phone rang sharp and shrill, catching the men by surprise. One of the men roughly nudged Dan in the side. Hey, Gup, the boss is calling. Dan reluctantly picked up the phone. Hello? Yes. Air meat. It's out of season. It's forbidden. The gamekeepers are keeping an eye. Do you have frozen bear meat? The customer wants it fresh. Oh, I understand. I'll get it. Picking their rifles and all the necessary equipment, the poachers got out of the sioux and headed back into the forest. Next, the gloomy trees closed in behind them. A sense of foreboding gripped all five members of the team. They wandered through the forest for a long time and suddenly came across a trail, a bear trail. Well, that's it. We need to kill the bear so we can return with the spoils, get the money, and live without worries. At least for a while. Let's split up. We have to surround it or it will escape. Dan commanded. But the poachers scattered, and suddenly a bear's roar and a man's scream was heard from somewhere on the right side, quickly silenced. Damn it, whispered one of the hunters. I don't want this kind of happiness. He screamed and rushed to flee, but before he could run a few meters, he fell into a wolf pit and was left bleeding, pierced by sharp spikes. Antilly, the gamekeepers, hadn't noticed the trap set by other poachers and hadn't removed it in time. First, the third poacher, like the first, realized the danger too late and met a similar fate. Also, he went after the bear and immediately received a fatal blow. Dan was nervously fidgeting. He realized that something had happened to his team. He made the trigger ready and began searching for the target amongst the trees. There it was, the beast trying to escape. Dan aimed and pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. Oh no, Dan fearfully said and felt a powerful blow to his head. The bear didn't torment him, quickly ending it. If her sniffing disdainfully at the dead poacher, it snorted and slowly disappeared into the forest. 
Its soul was now at peace.